Hello and welcome back to Psychopathology Lesson 6. This is part 2 of the OCD topic, but don't worry if you missed part 1. Watch out for the links, they'll be popping up during this video, um, and then you can just click on it. Alternatively, there is also a link in the description section below, so you can go ahead and check out part 1 um, when you're done with this. In this video, we're going to be looking at biological explanations for OCD. We're going to be looking at the role of genes, the role of neurotransmitters, and also the role of certain structures in the brain. So research into the role of genes in OCD has mainly focused on trying to identify specific candidate genes that are implicated in the development of OCD. And that research has suggested that OCD is actually a polygenic condition. Now, polygenic means that there's not just one gene that's responsible for its development, but in fact that there are many genes that contribute. And research by Taylor in 2003 suggests that there are in fact as many as 230 different genes that could be involved in the condition, and that variations of these genes contribute to different types of OCD. Now there are two specific examples of candidate genes that we're going to look at in this video. One of them is called the COMPT gene, and the other one is called the CERT gene. The COMP gene is involved in the production of something called catechol-O-methyltransferase, COMPT for short. And COMPT regulates the production of dopamine, a neurotransmitter that has been implicated in OCD. Now, genes come in a variety of different forms. However, one particular variation of the COMP gene has been found to be more common in people with OCD than those without it. And this variation results in a higher level of dopamine in the brain. The CERT gene, on the other hand, affects the transport of the neurotransmitter serotonin. Now, issues with the transportation of serotonin results in lower levels of serotonin being active in the brain. And it's these lower levels that are associated with the development of OCD. And this was researched by Ozaki et al. in 2003, who found a mutation in this gene across two separate families, where seven of eight members had OCD. Now, even though there's a great deal of research into the different genes that could be involved in the development of OCD, and research has pointed to specific candidate genes, in reality, it's highly unlikely that any one gene or any combination of genes is solely responsible for the development of OCD. It's far too complex a condition for that to be the case. And also, we have to bear in mind that a lot of the genes that have been implicated in OCD are also implicated in other disorders, such as depression. So that being the case, it's far more likely that these genes actually produce a vulnerability to certain disorders, rather than producing the disorder itself. And that certain environmental stresses, such as divorce, death of a loved one, stress at work, or any other form of psychological trauma, would then trigger the condition in those people that have the vulnerability. And this is known as the diathesis stress model. The diathesis is the genetic vulnerability, and the stress is the trauma that would act as a trigger. If you have the genetic vulnerability, but you never experience a stressor, you won't develop the condition. If you experience the stressor, but you don't have the genes, you'll also never develop the condition. And if you have the genes and experience a stressor, then you could develop the condition. Okay, so this is the idea that genes work together with the environment to produce OCD, which is a far more likely explanation than it just being down to genes. Okay, moving on, we have the role of neurotransmitters, and both the neurotransmitters serotonin and dopamine are believed to play a role in OCD, like we already kind of touched on when we were looking at the COMPT and the CERT gene. Serotonin regulates mood, and lower levels of serotonin have been associated with certain mood disorders such as OCD, depression, anxiety disorder, and so on, which could possibly be caused by the CERT gene. Now, research into this was conducted by Piggott et al. in 1990 and Yenneke et al. in 1992, and in their respective studies, they found that antidepressants that increase serotonin actually reduce the symptoms of OCD whereas antidepressants that don't have an effect on serotonin don't affect the symptoms of OCD at all. 
The fact that we can increase levels of serotonin in the brain, which then decreases symptoms of OCD, suggests that actually low levels of serotonin are a cause or are at least implicated in the development of OCD as a condition. Dopamine, on the other hand, is slightly less well-researched. However, animal studies have suggested that high levels of dopamine are related to compulsive behaviours that are symptomatic of OCD. Okay, and then finally, we have the role of certain structures in the brain. This also comes under neural explanations, just so that you know for exam questions. So, this explanation looks at the idea that specific regions of the brain seem to be involved in OCD. And one of these regions is located in the frontal lobe and is called the orbitofrontal cortex. Now, the orbital frontal cortex is involved in loads of different stuff, but one of the things that it does is relay information about things that are potentially worrying or risky to other areas of the brain, and then converts that information into actions. So if you're thinking about the characteristics of OCD, you've got worrying information could link to anxiety, and actions could lead to compulsions. Okay, so just linking the two lessons together there. Um, and research into this has actually found through PET scans that there's higher activity in the orbital frontal cortex of patients with OCD, particularly when their symptoms are active. Now, what we mean by active symptoms is that if you took a patient who had um, OCD relating to germs, let's say, and then made them hold a dirty item, their symptoms would be active. And in a case like this, the overactive orbital frontal cortex would be sending you loads of information about how worrying this particular situation is, and then it would be converting that worrying information, or it would be converting that information into behaviours such as wash your hands over and over and over again, which would then potentially link to compulsions. Okay, so that's just one of the ways that certain brain structures could link to OCD. So before we finish off, I've just got a couple of evaluation points for you and then a few example exam questions. So as always with the evaluation points, I've taken three that I like and three that work quite nicely. There are of course many, many others that you can choose from. It just depends on which book you're using and whether or not you find any that you like more than the ones I've given you. So, first off, some supporting evidence for the role of genes in OCD. It's very simple, it's nice, it's got a study in it, which is always a good thing for an evaluation point, and it is essentially the fact that research reviewed previous twin studies and found that 68% of identical twins shared OCD as opposed to 31% of non-identical twins. Okay, so it isn't a massively complicated evaluation point, it's also not a massively complicated study, however the fact that it is a study and the fact that it is research makes it very very nice to use in an essay. Moving on, you've also got some supporting evidence for environmental risk factors. Now, environmental risk factors essentially means the diathesis stress model. Okay, so you've got another study here by Cromer et al. in 2007 who found that over half the OCD patients in their sample had had a traumatic event in their past, and that OCD was even more severe in those patients who had had more than one trauma. Okay, so again, this gives you a little bit of supporting evidence for the diathesis stress model. Equally, you can of course flip this evaluation point on its head, because if you didn't talk about the diathesis stress model in your outline, then you could always use this as a limitation of genetic explanations, because then you can say that research has shown that environmental risk factors also exist, and therefore it can't just be entirely genetic in origin. Okay, so you can use this evaluation point as a little bit of both. It could be a strength, it could be a limitation, it just depends on what it is that you're using it for. It's a strength of the diathesis stress model, it is a limitation of genes being the sole cause of OCD. And then finally, we have a limitation for neural explanations for OCD, and this is a limitation all around causation. So essentially what it's saying is that even though there is a lot of evidence that suggests that neural systems are somewhat 
abnormal in people with OCD, whether that's something like your orbital frontal cortex or whether it's something about your levels of serotonin. One way or the other, research has implicated these. However, the issue is that other areas of the brain have also been identified as being occasionally involved in OCD. And because of that, there's no one system that has been consistently found to play a role. In some people, it's serotonin. In the majority of people, it's serotonin. But in some people, it's not. And in some people, it's orbital frontal cortex. And in some people, it's dopamine, and so on and so on. So even though there's evidence that neurotransmitters and brain structures are implicated, we can't conclude that there's a cause and effect relationship because it's quite difficult to actually determine whether or not biological abnormalities are a cause of OCD or rather the result of OCD. Okay, so there is an issue of cause and effect there. Okay, and then finally, just before we finish, just a couple of exam questions here. Now, obviously, you can get a whole range of exam questions for this topic. You can get outline, evaluate, apply, you know, there's all kinds of stuff. So I've just picked out two um, that I found because they were quite nice. So on the left, you've got outline and discuss one biological explanation for OCD. Now, outline and discuss is an essay. However, this essay is slightly bizarre because it is a six mark essay. So that's two marks for outline and four marks for your evaluation. Now this question was lifted from a specimen paper from AQA. So realistically, I don't know how likely it is a question like this will actually come up in an exam because who knows what AQA are going to do in the future. Nevertheless, it's probably not a bad idea to actually try and answer this question for six marks because outlining something for two marks is very, very tricky and it requires you to condense and it requires you to choose what you want to talk about very carefully. Um, the other question on the right hand side, we're not as interested in part A because that's more of a characteristics question. However, part B is quite interesting because it asks you with reference to the study above, what do the results seem to show about the influences on the development of OCD? And because the research found that the degree of inheritance is between 45 and 65%, what it's actually getting at is this idea that OCD can't be completely genetic because if it was completely genetic, then the degree of inheritance would be more like 100%. Okay, so that particular question is actually getting at um, more of a diathesis stress model explanation rather than a genetic explanation. Okay, so it's just one to be aware of. It's quite a nice question. Something like that comes up quite a lot. So just don't be thrown off if you do get one in one of your exams. So that is the end of the video. As always, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the comment section below and I will get back to you ASAP. I hope it's made sense. I hope it's been useful and look out for the next OCD video in the sequence, which will be on biological treatments. Thank you very much for listening.